Innovation isn't like the cartoons. You know, in the cartoon, bing, the light bulb goes on. Great, that's a bright idea. But it's not innovation. We understand that in order to make that bright idea have value, we've got to put some kind of process in place. We can't guarantee success, but we know we can make things work in our favour if we have some kind of a process to enable ideas to happen. Now that's fine. That's something that's in my textbook. It's something most organisations would recognise. Basically, innovation needs a process to make it happen. Fine. Except, one thing we shouldn't forget is that this is a map. It's a model. It's a representation. And just like a map, it helps us get somewhere, but it isn't the place itself. It's a description. It's a representation. So I've got no problems with this as long as we don't forget one really important point. Innovation doesn't happen like that. It happens like that. Now, don't worry if you can't see the detail. That's quite deliberate. All I want you to see is spaghetti. Because that's what innovation really is. Knowledge spaghetti. It's technical knowledge, and market knowledge, and legal knowledge, and financial knowledge, all sorts of strands of knowledge held by all sorts of people inside and outside the organisation. And our job, if we want to innovate, is to weave those strands together to create value. Business value, social value, innovation. Now, we can superimpose on top of the spaghetti some structure, we can put our model in place, that's fine as long as we don't forget that underneath it's this not this set of knowledge spaghetti. Now why is that important? Well really because in today's world we're drowning in knowledge. There's just so much knowledge out there we've got a real problem in working with that knowledge spaghetti to create our particular value. Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, if we take research Research and development creates new knowledge. It's hugely important in innovation. Trouble is that these days we have no idea how much research is being done. The best estimates we have, though, pretty scary. Something like $1,500 billion is spent every year around the world in public and private sector research. That's a huge number. It means that no matter what we do, have we any real idea of what else is out there? And that's $1,500 billion a year. So there's new knowledge coming on stream all the time. We're drowning in knowledge. But of course, innovation isn't just about technical knowledge, about R&D. It's also about markets. But here we have the same story. We understand about a billion people quite well. We've done a lot of market research, we've really analysed, we understand their needs and we're good at meeting them. But there are another six billion people on the planet and they are in the emerging markets. They're in Africa and rural Asia and Latin America, places that we don't really understand so well and people whose lifestyles are very different. So there's a great deal of that knowledge spaghetti that if we're serious about innovation, we need to learn to understand and work with. So we're in a world in which there is masses more knowledge spaghetti that we have to work with. Now the good news is we have a label for the challenge. The label is called Open Innovation. And it's a very specific label. It was actually one coined by an American professor, Henry Chesborough, in the year 2003. He published a book with that title. And if I distill the essence of what he was talking about, he's basically saying, in a world where there is so much knowledge out there, even the largest organisation has to say to itself, hmm, actually, not all the smart people work for us. And as soon as you say that, everything changes. What is out there that we might make use of and how would we find it and bring it in? And what do we know that somebody out there might make use of? This whole idea of knowledge becoming much more fluid that's the real challenge in knowledge spaghetti. And these pictures are just examples of many, many organisations who've been wrestling with this question for the last 10 years or so. How do we work with a very knowledge-rich world? How do we deal with open innovation? And really, this is a challenge very much about making connections. We've known innovation has always been a multiplayer game. 
Henry Chesborough gave it a nice label, but long before that, we've known innovation is about different strands of spaghetti coming together. But these days, it's becoming absolutely essential to rethink and revise our approaches to deal with knowledge that's out there as well as in our organizations. And the shift is from owning, creating and owning knowledge, it's still important, to knowledge flows, knowledge trading, moving knowledge in a much more fluid, in and out kind of fashion. And that poses challenges for organizations, in large organizations, even inside. If you think of a large organization, it has many thousands of people, all of whom have strands of that knowledge spaghetti. Does a company like Heller know what it knows? Is it taking advantage of what it already has inside the organization? This is part of that knowledge spaghetti challenge. And of course, those clever organizations that mobilize that knowledge can get all their employees to contribute, can get a real benefit from this. But it's not just a challenge. There are also some wonderful new tools available to help us deal with the challenge. All sorts of things. For example, innovation contests. Innovation contests like the driving innovation contest that Heller itself has been running where we're trying to mobilize lots of internal ideas about an innovation challenge. Innovation marketplaces, crowdsourcing, these are all new techniques, particularly enabled by the internet, which allow us to work more extensively with knowledge spaghetti. Here's a couple of examples. Innocentive.com is an example of an innovation marketplace, and there are many of these around now. And the idea is very simple. It's like eBay for innovation. And just like eBay, you basically have a very simple market idea. On the one hand, you have in the marketplace seekers, people looking for a solution to a problem. And on the other side are solvers. Well, we think we can. And the beauty of it is, just like eBay, anybody can play. Nine-year-old schoolboy, 90-year-old retired engineer, anyone in between. Seekers, solvers put them together across a marketplace, and we add to our ability to work with the spaghetti. Now, what's interesting about Innocentive and places like that is that it's not a place where lazy companies can say, hmm, we don't need to do any research, we'll just buy it from them. It's not like that. The real value comes because those people on the solver side are all different, and they have different perspectives on problems. Innocentive have about 200,000 people registered as regular solvers. That's a vast set of people, but the real power is they're all different. So you have all sorts of different ideas about a problem you may have been wrestling with for some time. And that's the real value. We're opening up to very different strands of spaghetti. Here's another example, crowdsourcing. Now, you might think Swarovski make beautiful crystals, and of course they have wonderful designers making products using those crystals. But maybe other people have ideas as well. And so, like many businesses, Swarovski now are opening up the innovation challenge at the front end. Have you got an idea of how we could use our crystals? Please let us know. Please join with us. This idea of spreading the net more widely, using the internet as a way of capturing that, essentially working with the knowledge spaghetti. But innovation isn't just about new stuff. Sometimes innovation is about knowledge which is well understood in one world, moving across to a different world where it is new and has real value. It's the idea of what one of my colleagues calls recombinant innovation. And it's a very powerful source. This man understood that very well. It's a picture of Thomas Edison. And you can see here he is with one of his great innovations, the gramophone. And that was one of the many contributions he made. He gave us the electric telegraph, which revolutionized communication, the electric light. The electric chair was one of his many contributions. But basically, Edison was a genius at innovation and also rather good at public relations because this picture is typical. You get the sense from this picture that there's this genius, this man with such a fertile imagination, he could come up with so many different things that the world needed. It's not true. He was a genius, no argument, he's one of my heroes, but his real gift was innovation management. He understood this idea of recombinant innovation. He set up his invention factory in New Jersey. He promised the world a new idea every week, a breakthrough every six months, and he was largely able to deliver on that. 
but not just on his own. What he cleverly did was to hire clever young engineers, smart people from all the new industries springing up in the US at that time. People from the new food canning industry, from this new thing called the car industry, from the electric telegraph and communications industry, all these different industries. He got people who knew about those worlds to come together. They worked together, they ate together, they even slept in the same space. Must have smelt terrible. But what you had was a kind of hothouse for innovation. And his idea was simple. Any problem that 20th century America has, we've probably got a solution in this room. Somebody's seen something like that before. We could combine that knowledge spaghetti to create solutions. Recombinant innovation. Now bring that forward to the 21st century. One of the areas I work on is healthcare. And one of the problems in any hospital is how to get the best out of your expensive equipment and your expensive people. And a good place where this happens is the operating theatre. Operating theatre really wants people in there, working, patients being treated, and then you want to turn it round as fast as possible. When that patient is finished, get them out, clean everything up, sterilise everything, bring in a new patient, start again. The faster you can turn those things round, the better. So they're looking for innovations. And they find a lot, of course, talking to colleagues, but they've also picked up a lot through recombinant innovation. Somewhere else, a different world has the same problem. You may not be a fan of motor racing, but try and watch a Grand Prix next time it's on television. And you don't have to watch for long, but just watch what are called the pit stops. That's the bit where the car screams into a special lane, all the team dive at the car. They take the wheels off, put new wheels on, they fill it up with fuel, they wash the windscreen, they wash the driver, vroom, and the car goes off again. Ferrari can do that in six seconds. Now, it's a turnaround. It's the same basic problem as the operating theatre. And so in one of the big London hospitals, the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, in looking for new ideas, looking for innovation, they got the Ferrari pit stop crew to come in and talk about and share how they do the changeover. What I liked about that example of recombinant innovation is not only did the hospital learn some really interesting ideas, the Ferrari guys as they were leaving said, thank you, we've got some ideas we're going to take back to the racetrack. Recombinant innovation, knowledge spaghetti. But it's not just about the supply side. We also need to think about users. Now, here's a picture of a Model T Ford. Now, you might look more closely and see it's not just a Model T Ford. This enterprising farmer has taken a few bits of wood, hammered them together and built a little cage so that he can take the goat to market. Another farmer says, do you know, I never use the back seat, so I'll throw them out and I'll cut a bit here and now I've got a truck and I can fill it with hay to take to the animals in the fields. And another farmer says, Ah, these iron tyres are no good in the snow. What I really need is a Model T snowmobile. And so he built one. These are all real examples of what farmers are good at. Farmers are very interesting. They're very pragmatic. They have to be. And farmers very often want something to work. They really have a high incentive for innovation and they don't mind if it's not perfect. They're prepared to tolerate it not being perfect because they want what it does. Farmers are typical of that and they're a class of what we call user innovators. But it's not the only place down on the farm where you find them. One of the areas where this is very common is in the medical world. We know from many studies that most medical instruments don't come from a manufacturing company, they come from practitioners. Doctors and nurses and theatre technicians working in a space and saying, you know, for this operation, what we want is a retractor with, with three joints and a little claw and perhaps a fibre optic light here. They've done your job. They maybe sketched a design. They can certainly say what they need. They may build a prototype. And a lot of medical innovation is user-led. Their ideas create the innovation. This man is perhaps an extreme version of that. Uh, I mentioned before, user innovators have a high incentive to innovate. He had a pretty high incentive. He was dying. He had a heart problem. Most of the technology that was available, most of the operations, not very good prospects. What he really needed was a rather specialised valve. He's an engineer. Rather like those farmers, 
High incentive to innovate, not afraid to try something out. What does he have to lose? He designed his own heart valve, had it implanted. Thankfully it works, he's still alive, and so are many other people using his innovation. Perhaps an extreme form of user innovation. But all of us touch innovation of this kind if we use a smartphone, because the chances are your smartphone is running on some software called Linux. And there is no giant Linux corporation in the way there is Microsoft. Linux, 20 years or so back, was a community of frustrated users. They thought software could be better, so they started to create it. And they are still, as a community, creating world-class software, user-led innovation. This is what I want for my Christmas present. It's a 3D printer. Now, you may not be as geeky as I am, but basically what this thing does is anything I can imagine and design, it will make. Now, you may not want to have one of these in your bedroom, doesn't matter. You could go online and there are many bureau now who would do this for you. You bring the ideas for some furniture or some jewellery, anything you can imagine, and we'll help you realise those ideas and make it. And there's a whole revolution going on in this space. This is, again, changing the relationship between users and creators. A company like Lego has taken significant advantage of this. Lego's gone through a long journey. It had a very bad time around 2002 where it made bad losses, but the company's turned around. It's more successful than ever. And one part of that is the way it's changed its relationships with its users. You can still consume Lego in the traditional way. Their designers create wonderful products that you can buy in the shops. But for a long time now, they've realised many children have really good ideas for toys, for robots and dinosaurs and cars and all sorts of stuff. And for a long time, there was a site called Lego Factory where children were invited to submit their designs or even use simple tools online and create them. And Lego would then take the designs, work out the bricks and other pieces they'd need, generate some building instructions. You could even design the box, and they'd send it back as a customised product. Lego Factory was very popular. But what Lego noticed was that some children were saying, you know, that design I've seen, I really like that, that's cool. I'd like one of those as well. And so what Lego now have is something called Lego Kuso. And this is a very simple idea. It's the Lego factory meets the Facebook concept. So they display designs that children have come up with and other children like them. They vote on them. They say, yes, that's cool. I'll support that. And you can see these pictures have thousands of supporters. When you get to the stage that this young guy has got where his idea for space marines has 10,000 likes, that's a pretty good market message to Lego that maybe it's worth making this thing. So they might go ahead and make this, but then they have to say to Nick Royer, the lucky boy in this case, well, actually, Nick, it's such a good design and you designed it. We have to share that with you. You're a designer, part of our team. We'll give you a royalty. And what you've effectively got is the breaking down of that interface between creators and consumers, producers and users. And this is, again, part of our spaghetti world. In all sorts of sectors, users are now becoming very active players, especially in services. So, our spaghetti challenge. Innovation's always been an open multiplayer game, but these days in a knowledge-rich world, we have to look for new ways of managing these knowledge flows. The good news is there's lots of powerful new tools, but we have to still work with those tools inside and outside our organisations. Connecting to different worlds is a hugely important piece of this, and also working with users. But the big challenge this poses, and the one we don't have the answers to yet, is how are we going to make it happen? And there isn't one single answer. There are many, many possibilities. I've mentioned some that have to do with the, uh, the, the internet as a tool to bring many different players together, innovation contests, crowdsourcing, innovation markets. But there are many other mechanisms. Organisations are making a lot of use now of third parties, of brokers, rather like marriage brokers, introducing partners and allowing them to get to know each other and share and trade knowledge. Inside organisations, we're thinking about social networks. Knowledge doesn't flow from everybody to everyone else, it flows through people. And there are key people called gatekeepers who say, you know, what I just heard from John is really interesting because Jane is interested in that area and I'll connect them. This idea of helping knowledge to flow. 
But if knowledge is flowing more freely, what do we do about intellectual property? We've got a system of patents and copyright which did us really well in the past. We've probably got to revise and innovate that to cope with this free flow of knowledge. So for any organisation, big or small, this knowledge-rich world opens up great opportunities, but it poses some fundamental questions. How are we going to work in our organisation with this rich set of opportunities around managing knowledge spaghetti? <laughs>